Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Rekindi. Before I begin, I just wanted to apologize for the poorer sound quality. As I'm sure you can tell, I'm not in my usual recording studio. I'm just doing a bit of traveling, so I found a cool sound booth, and hopefully that should suffice. Um, so today's podcast is a carry-on from the previous round surrounding the topics of epigenetics or gene editing. So if you haven't already checked out the previous podcast, I highly recommend doing so. So today we're joined by Joe Zayner. Joe is a biohacker artist and scientist with a history of programming, a BA in plant biology and a PhD in biophysics from the University of Chicago. Before receiving her, her PhD, Joe also earned a master's in science specializing in cell and molecular biology. Not to mention, wow, sounds intense. <laughs> it's what you've done. It's pretty phenomenal. And uh, not to mention <laughs> your previous involvement in NASA biology research. Yeah. Center where you actually helped potential Martian colony habitat. I mean, I just think that is awesome. Oh, that's and, crazy. Yeah, so now you're known for your self-experimentation and work on hands-on engineering, genetic engineering accessible to the lay audience through your company, Odin. So with all of that, thank you so much for joining us, Joe, and welcome. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So do you want to tell everyone like a little bit about your journey? I mean, obviously... I've touched on the things that you've done, which is just such a huge background that I think maybe not so many people are aware of when they, they hear you in a passing conversation of somebody who's trying to make genetic engineering or editing available to everyone. Tell us a bit more about your background, what put you interested in this journey, and what are you doing now? Yeah, I think at heart, I'm a reductionist. I like to just break things down as simple as possible. And plants were my first love in biology. And so for me, I think in biology, my first love was plants. And it's crazy because plants take sunlight, they take carbon dioxide from the air, and they take molecules from the soil. And from that, they build these giant trees or giant plants. And you're just like, that's crazy. When you think about like, an elephant getting to be the size of a tree weighing that much, how much food it has to eat. And a plant gets it from the soil and sun and CO2. And that's it. And you're just like, how does that work? How does a plant eat enough sunlight to grow to be that big? And I wanted to understand how that happens on molecular level, on the most basic level. How does that happen? So I began studying genetics and genetic engineering and all these things. And it helped me understand that like these things that we see in our world, because all living things have DNA, we can modify and change these things. We could play around with these things and we could program these things. And it inspired me to have a career in genetic engineering. I got my PhD and then I went and worked at NASA and I started a biotech company all based around genetic engineering. Very cool. And so what you, one of the things you go by is biohacker. So what exactly is being a biohacker? Yeah, for me, a biohacker is somebody who's trying to do science outside traditional environments. It's somebody who's just trying to explore the world around them with no boundaries. I think a lot of times nowadays, scientists often have these artificial limits placed on themselves by like publishing or getting grants or maybe even like from being politically or socially correct. And think a biohacker is somebody who doesn't have these boundaries and they can explore science, genetic engineering as deep as they want. Yeah, no, that's very true. In 2016, you did a full body micro transplant. Talk me about <laughs> how make you do this, the steps, the risks, the outcome. Watched a short piece by New York Times and um, the process looked pretty brutal. I mean, it was just not something you do on a whim. So what made you do that and then how did you feel? Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, first I just had this idea. I suffered from like gastrointestinal issues and I had this idea. At the time, we understood that there's bacteria and microbes in our body and on our body and in our gut that contribute 
to our health in some way, but people didn't know exactly how or what to do about it. And so I was suffering from gastrointestinal issues and a lot of people, their communities online of just people suffering from gastrointestinal distress and issues. But nobody had really tried to methodically test and see what happens if I transplanted bacteria from a healthy person into me and documented the whole process. It was pretty wild. Uh, it was like one of the first time I did, I consider most of the experiments I do artistic, like a mix of science and art a little bit. But yeah, it was the first time I did one of these like experiments, public experiments that I do. And it was hard. It was took a toll on my body and yeah, it was pretty wild, but I sequenced all the bacteria in my body, took like 60 samples to see how they would change over time with the experiment. And the bacteria in my gut completely got replaced by this healthy person's bacteria. And it really changed you know, how I felt and helped me a lot. And it was funny because people were all like, it wasn't really like a clinical trial or scientific. And about a year ago, I was just scrolling through Facebook and this ad, I'm not even kidding, this ad came up and I see myself in this ad and I'm like, what? Nobody talked to me about this. And it was this company, Novo Nordisk, which is a big pharmaceutical company saying, oh, the experiment I did inspired them to start to develop drugs to treat gut health. And it was, it was pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. I'm, I've got a quite a big fascination with the gut health and um, I, I oh, yeah? had some intestinal issues and it was a huge, it took me like two, three years of like having a huge amount of like probiotics, prebiotics, but like everything in between and just restructuring my diet. And your gut makes such a huge difference. I mean, it really is a whole ecosystem inside of your tummy. So to do something like that, I could understand would really change your whole way that you, what food you crave and Everything. Yeah. It's interesting because we don't think a lot about it, but like gut affects us so much, right? Because it's like how we digest our food, how we feel, like it really affects us a lot, a lot more than people would imagine. And so in the same year, you also created the fluorescent beer, which I'm guessing that is what you really a pretty detailed timeline. You should send it to me. I don't even remember. <laughs> really, I, when I start the food company that I'm like interested in, I like just become a, like not weirdly obsessed, but through <laughs> so much reading about it because the more I feel like I learn about you and what you do, it gives me an insight into like a little bit about, I don't know, not who you are, but the journey and the steps. And so then I learn like what could you interest in those things? And then also how you did those things and then what propelled you yeah. to go to the next thing. And you can see this beautiful timeline as it plays out and it's awesome. Like, Oh yeah. Wow. Cool. I'm glad yeah. you see it that way. Yeah. It's interesting because generally I just try to, when something inspires me, I just can't get it out of my head. And then I just like do it and whatever. And so usually the timeline is just like a progression of my capabilities, my understanding of everything. And the fluorescent beer was interesting because it was right after I started my company and we were like, why has nobody ever made fluorescent beer before? Like people have genetically engineered yeast and people have genetically engineered things to make them fluorescent. Why hasn't anybody made fluorescent beer yeast or brewing yeast or anything like that. And uh, we just decided to see how difficult it was. And <laughs> it wasn't actually that difficult, which was really cool. We got a bit of pushback from the FDA in the U.S. saying that like making genetically engineered fluorescent yeast was a food additive and you couldn't sell it. And it was pretty weird. We just ignored them and kept selling it and uh, <laughs> it's been good. I mean, they've taken this gene. So the gene that makes it fluorescent is from a jellyfish. Mm. And so this gene like is in organisms. 
and they put it in a lot of different organisms and non-toxic in every organism that they can put it in, basically. So the idea that humans consuming it in yeast would somehow hurt them or kill them, I, th- I think it's pretty silly. Um, but yeah. When you do gene editing with something like that, is there only a specific amount? Because you said you can put it in, in anything. Like if you had to sort of with humans' genes and put that same bioluminescent or fluorescent gene in, would that work? Or is it like some of it would be? Yeah, I actually tried that. What? Yeah. yeah. So I think that was something I was really interested in after the glowing beer was like, could I make my skin glowing? I mean, isn't that like the logical progression? Yeah. And did it work? So my skin didn't actually glow. I was able to measure the jellyfish DNA in my skin. Wow. But I didn't actually see any glow. And uh, that's probably because it's a little more... Skin is a really hard thing to genetically modify because on our bodies, the skin that's like on there, a lot of it's dead. So we have like layers of dead skin cells, right? And so removing these dead skin cells, getting fresh skin cells, modifying these fresh skin cells well enough to actually be able to see the genetic modification um, is surprisingly difficult. Yeah. So do you think that's also like, would you have... But I, I am the first human jellyfish hybrid. Huh? <laughs> wow. So your body's still... Is it like, like not dominant <laughs> suppressed? So do you think that all of that is... Your body just like, actually, this, something doesn't seem right here. So they suppress it. <clears throat> Maybe it's possible that happens sometimes for sure. When you put in outside DNA, it'll sil- your body will silence it. So it's possible. But I think also it was just the amounts weren't large enough for me to actually turn into a jellyfish yet. What? So what other part? Like if I had to take a piece of your DNA and like look under a microscope, <laughs> What other parts would I see in there? What is Joe right now? <laughs> Good question. Yeah, you know, so I don't know what your progression, you have to go with the timeline and I'll keep talking. So, so what do you have next? On the okay, this is where we start to get a little controversial. So in 2020, uh-huh. yourself, David and Jerry made your own DNA based coronavirus vaccine. Oh, wow. We jumped to 2020. We got to go back. Okay. Let's go back. We go back a little bit. I think it was in like 2017 or 2018. A lot of the stuff I do, like I said before, I consider it more art or like performance art than science, even though it is science. Like I'm actually doing a PhD trained in genetic engineering, but traditionally science is done in a lab under specific conditions and like you're measuring specific results in specific ways and you're writing a paper and publishing it. And that's generally not what I do. I like to document the process through video and use it to challenge people's perception of things. And uh, I think it was in 2017 or 2018, I did an experiment where I injected myself with uh, this new genetic engineering technology called CRISPR. And CRISPR is a genetic engineering technology that allows you to edit genome inexpensively and easy and fast that anybody can do it. But up until that point in time, nobody had really tested it on humans. Everybody was saying this was going to be the next biggest thing and it was going to help and save humanity, but nobody was testing it on humans. And it was very frustrating for a lot of people including myself. And I just thought like, why don't I just inject myself with some of this and test it on me? I trust, I I believe the science. I've read all the data. I know it's safe. I know it's not going to hurt me. So I did an experiment where I injected myself with this CRISPR gene editing technology and I didn't die, obviously. And there were no ill effects. The goal was to edit a gene in my body and it's unclear if that happened. It's really hard to measure because you have to take cells out, right? So you have to like use a biopsy and remove cells and then take them and measure the DNA. So it wasn't clear if it actually worked. So I could have that gene edit also in me. That's another one. 
one time I tried to modify my skin color. Yeah. Like a lot of because- darker so the process to make your skin darker is controlled mainly by one gene this gene tyrosinase produces all melanin mm-hmm. right and i thought wouldn't that be funny if i could like darken my skin color by putting this gene in there it'd be a very in commentary on racism and people who are prejudiced towards people based on their skin color if they knew it was just a single gene that could cause this change, like make being racist a little more complicated, maybe. But racist people are probably stupid in general, so they wouldn't care. You know, you get what I'm saying. That didn't work. At least not that I could tell because it's complicated, because it's amazing how much skin color variation happens just on a day-to-day basis. So when you're trying to like monitor skin color change in like an area of your arm, it's surprisingly difficult, unless it's just like so drastic. Yeah. Yeah. So that might be something else. And then the COVID vaccine, that was genetic modification. Yeah. So that was your, your that was not an RNA, that was a DNA. Yeah. Um, like so, and what was the outcome? Well, talk us through the steps and what was the outcome from that? Yeah. So it was in, I think, May ish of 2020. There was a paper that came out, a scientific paper that came out that showed that a DNA-based vaccine for coronavirus prevented coronavirus infection in macaque monkeys. And uh, this was early 2020. We just basically found out about coronavirus and started locking everything down around March, right? And so... Nobody had yet had access to a vaccine or anything like that. And when I saw this paper, I was like, this is really interesting. Why isn't anybody testing this in humans or are they? And nobody was testing this in humans. And I was like, why are people testing this in humans? Generally, that's the way my brain works is like, why hasn't anybody done this yet? Seems like to me, the logical next step is if you find out it works in monkeys, test it in humans. If it protects humans from coronavirus. So I had the vaccine manufactured, designed the vaccine similar to the one that they use in the paper, had it manufactured. And we, me and David and Daria created a live stream, the process of how to create a vaccine from scratch, any vaccine. But in, in this case, we were making a coronavirus vaccine. And we tested it on ourselves and we tested our antibody level and we tested the ability of our antibodies to prevent coronavirus binding to proteins and stuff. And it appeared to work. We all had responses immunologically with our antibodies and stuff. So that was pretty crazy. And we did this before any vaccine was publicly available. It was wild and it was pretty exciting, but we got banned from YouTube for it. And uh, most countries don't use DNA vaccines except India. India is one of the few countries that uses DNA vaccines. And it's surprising nobody does because DNA is way more stable than these mRNA vaccines. It's way easier to produce, way more inexpensive to produce. So it was surprising that nobody really ended up going with a DNA vaccine except India. So your Odin company at the moment, which is making essentially what you're doing with and with gene editing available to everyone. And you mentioned it was like 2017 when you did your first test on yourself. And I think it was like a month later or something, somebody else did that same, not that same, but did a self-experimentation. And one of the videos I watched of you was like, um, that to you even was a little bit like concerning of like, wow, I didn't think people would be jumping on that this quickly. So by distributing that everywhere, I think it's very cool that you're offering courses and allowing people to become aware of this because I do see that if, if only corporations have control over where we're going, then that provides a very narrow window in terms of where they would like humanity to lead rather than having this technology easily acceptable, yeah. accessible. But in terms of the risks, like looking at gene drive, I, I find that is quite interesting. And I spoke to David Ishii briefly about it. And so I just wanted to talk with you about some of these concerns, like what what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, 
what do you think? So do you think like, I'm interested in your opinion on like, you have access, to, let's say you have access yes. to technology. Yeah. Do you think that's like too much responsibility or like, how does that mean? So I think that if there's some sort of, some sort of boundaries, so I do think that it's really cool that scientists would have access to this and people like yourself who have done the research, who have studied, you've got a master's. So when you start to do this experimentation, I feel like it could be, it's quite good in the sense that there's some level of knowledge and awareness. But then again, so David Ashi, who I spoke to, he didn't, he started from home and his knowledge is brilliant. And I also understand yeah. that a lot of people who go to university don't necessarily go because they want to learn. They want to go because they get a degree at the end. And th that's one of the interesting things about the brain is that when somebody's interested in learning, you can learn through decentralized platforms such as YouTube or Google. There is an abundance of resources out there. So I also do understand the breaking down of the centralized institution that you yeah. have to be represented and where that's heading. But when it comes to, that's why I'm actually having these podcasts because I feel like it is just such a controversial topic where on one side, I can really see the benefit of helping decentralize disease control or people who have yeah. a lot of these diseases that can be passed down through generation. Having that accessible is phenomenal. But then when I read stuff like the gene drive, I start to get a bit concerned of like, okay, what happens if you do pass something down through generations? But then I also understand that like, even with that, with the mice in New Zealand, it was really difficult for them to actually, once you had done that in a controlled environment, it was actually difficult for that to even work. So for something yeah. massive to spread across the entire population, I do get that that would be quite challenging. But the conversations I've had with an array of different people, more so my friends, some of them are extreme intellectuals, and they were like extremely anti this. And they were like, Alexa, you can't speak about this in such a nonchalant manner because it. <laughs> so I am on two minds. And that's why having. It makes you feel a little crazy when people respond. Like it makes me feel a little crazy. When people are like, you should be more concerned. And it's like, should I? I can't tell. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, when you am I the crazy one or are you the crazy one? I'm honestly. <laughs> I'm literally sitting on the fence and I can see either direction of where, and I understand it may not even be a dichotomy. Why do you have to choose between total con yeah. conservative where everything stays the same or a possibility, a possible future where people have gills and we can create unicorns. And I'm just trying to view what the future may look like. And Yeah, I think for me, a lot of it's like, look, like once technology becomes available, it's really hard to like take away or bottle up or like put back in the box. And so instead of, of figuring out ways and how we regulate this, which there should be some regulation, I feel like. So what does that regulation look like? If there should be some. Oh gosh, I'm not the person to ask about regulation, really. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm like anti-regulation but you know you uh, i think there's stuff we can all agree on right like i don't think that like anybody really needs you know play around with like ebola virus or something right well, yeah like i think the world will be okay if nobody tries to create an ebola virus vaccine in their home like yeah. you know it's not like destroying personal freedoms or anything like yeah. that you know? And that would be quite difficult to get access to as well, wouldn't it? Because like, even if you had to try and the previous conversation was like, even if you try all of those things online, you would have the FBI call you and it's like, Hey bro, why are you, why are you getting access to that? Totally. So like, I think there's like limits that we can all agree upon to start, right? Yeah. Which is, I think, totally fine. And I think figuring out how far to extend those limits is where is the hard part. Right. Like, is it wrong for somebody to have access to, I don't know, rhino virus? It just causes a cold or something. Is that bad? It's like, where do you draw the line? And I don't think for me, that's something that I want to decide. I think my goal is mainly just to provide people with knowledge and resources and then let the government decide where the boundaries are. 
and people create within those boundaries. Obviously, if the government outlawed everything, I would probably fight for some amount of access. But I think that one of my goals since the beginning has been just to give so much knowledge and so much access that if the government did try in the U.S. at least try to regulate this stuff, they would have a very difficult time because so many people already have and are using this technology. Mm. So if I bought this technology today, right, and started editing and playing around with things and I get seriously injured, are you, who would be liable if anyone? Oh, there's really, I mean, it's, you'd have a bigger chance of getting seriously injured with orange juice or something like yeah, well, I guess. this stuff, this technology is not. So you, let's say like you want it to like the kits we sell are purely educational. And not only that, like if you buy a kit to say, edit the genes of a plant, right? You could take that DNA and eat it and inject yourself with it and do whatever. And it wouldn't do anything to, to you, a human, right? Because that's not the way DNA works. It's like trying to take a program from an Apple computer and put it on a PC. Like it just won't run. The same thing with DNA. If you take DNA that's meant for a plant and you put it in, in a human, it's not going to do anything. We do have kits that allow people to edit human cells, but the genetic modifications are very innocuous. And the one we sell gives people the ability to, it gives the human cells the ability to process the sugar that then creates a blue color. So all that, the worst thing that would happen to you is you can like process the sugar, like it's really hard to kill yourself with or hurt yourself with gene editing, actually. Yeah, well, right? Okay. And because about- you have to think about like, what genes could you change to really hurt yourself? Insulin is one of them, for sure. Insulin is very, our bodies are very sensitive to insulin. But the majority of genes and hormones and things like that, like our bodies can withstand huge variations and fluctuations that make it so that like, even if you gene edited yourself to do something, like it'd be really hard to kill yourself that way or hurt yourself. And what about cancer? Cause like, wouldn't that be if you start to edit specific genes or specific cells and then they start being like, actually I'm not part of the rest of your body. Um, or is that not even a thing? No, it's possible, but you have to understand that you'd have to specifically want to edit those cells to create cancer. The chances that you got cancer spontaneously from some accident of gene editing is is a good question. And I'm sure a lot of people think about it is actually extremely tiny. It's usually a lot more precise than that to where you'd have to probably do it on purpose. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I think people underestimate how big and complicated genomes are. And just for something to happen randomly like that is, it's difficult, Mm. right? Yeah. And one of the other ones was like, so if I, if we start, so everybody has access to this, which they really do, but it becomes more mainstream and people are like, okay, cool. I want to get involved. The advantage is that this stuff starts to expand almost, I wouldn't say exponentially, may. So everyone's learning Uh with each other and that can be quite phenomenal because then you could achieve things that we never really thought were possible, right? Yeah. But now we're shifting the direction at which humanity is going where, let's say as a female or a, or a male, go like, actually, I want to have smaller hips because I think that's more attractive. Yeah. And I want to have like 10 breaths because, hey, fuck it, why not? So then we cook that. <laughs> and let's say all of a sudden I can't give birth because my hips aren't large enough or I can't breastfeed properly because so that, and I understand this is going, it, what if for them? No, but- I get it. I get it. I get it. I think that, like, obviously, we have to understand or try to understand the implications of these things. But I think it opens up so many opportunities. Oh, like me being transgender, like the ability of people to modify their bodies to be more congruent with how they see themselves and what makes them happy. Like, how can that be a bad thing, I think, right? Like, I think that's something that would make the world such a more positive place, right? Because we don't get a choice in this. And I think that's the crazy thing about 
life right now in humans, right? No human being gets a choice in anything straight about them, basically, right? Like we are born with this DNA that our parents didn't even get to choose. Our parents just had sex and produced an offspring. And that offspring was generated partially from their DNA, partially from some random stuff. And we came about. What if you had more of a choice about that? And I think that's the scary thing. It's scary because it changes what it means to be human because we've never had that power before. But I think it's also one of the most empowering and coolest things ever because we actually get that responsibility now, right? We get that responsibility to say, hey, like, I didn't want this body. I didn't want this trait. I'm not happy with that thing. For so long as human beings, we've been told that we should just accept who we are, right? No matter what. And that, that's healthy. I think that's okay. But also, now that we have the ability to change these things, I think we should embrace that. There's nothing wrong with changing yourselves, right? It's only from the idealistic view of human beings that like, why can't we change ourselves? That, I think that's super cool. Yeah, and I, look, to be honest, I think what you've just said before that was like, with the kids now, there's not a huge range of what people can do negatively in terms of like completely altering all of the human race. <laughs> One guy yeah. in his lab is like, I'm going to change the world. It, it sounds a lot more difficult than that. And I think that in itself puts my mind at ease so that like if somebody wants to change their body and show that may pass down to mm. their offspring, you have the potential to change that back because the, the genes yeah. are there. So it's not like everything. Is and it's really possible. hard to pass it down to your offspring, right? Because usually our bodies have a barrier between the blood and our sex organs. So like if you gene edited your body as an adult, it wouldn't be passed down to your children. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Okay. And so how much, what, how much like gene? Oh, another question is like, what are your views on George Church? So I had a read that he was like quite involved in your company. And then even he was like, okay. I need to be a bit more concerned about this. And uh, I think he left me or something. <laughs> George is, I, him and I, are acquaintances, maybe almost friends, depending on the time of the year. A little bit of nemesis is, but not, I, would, I would never call George my nemesis, but he is very academic in his mindset and the things he does. And the boundaries here he is trying to push are very traditional in what's going on. And I think in society, there are things that are more controversial, more complicated, that the boundaries need to be pushed on because it matters that much to us, especially around things like diversity of human beings and ability to change our bodies, how we see fits body autonomy, which is we don't have body autonomy as human beings. And it's crazy to think about that. Like the one thing that you unconditionally own your own body, governments and people and everybody controls what you do to it, right? They control what you can put into it. They control what you take out of it. They control so much about our bodies. And uh, I think that's sad and I, that's wrong. And I think that we need to change our perspective. Traditional people might say that like, we need to be conservative and concerned about this, but I think biohackers are like, no, like we need to push hard on this because it's so important to humanity. So for like George Church, would his views be that this should be kept in a lab or with people who have a huge amount of degrees and qualifications and so on, purely on the basis that it could ship humanity? Because what you say, it's like, oh, I can't speak directly for George or yeah. what he says. George's point of view, and I, he, his view is always evolving, so I don't know specifically what he would say now. But generally, George is somebody who is for some form of boundaries and protections that prevent, and even maybe surveillance, that 
prevents people from that that regulates people in some way who are doing science outside traditional environments yeah wow well, okay all right yeah so because yeah. this is the thing that like when i talk to people like you and i understand that this is where the fed sits is like on one side i can when i talk to you it's like oh but this really isn't such a big deal like it's really difficult to pass something onto your offspring. It's really difficult for you to actually yeah. completely transform all of human civilization. It's really just somebody editing a few genes within themselves. But then when there's such a large pushback from people like him, it's like, no, you don't understand the repercussions. You can't think this way. As somebody like myself, who, who's really just looking at both sides, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know which side is beneficial. I'm not, and I'm getting conflicting views. <laughs> I know it really is and sometimes like I said it makes you feel crazy because you're like wait am I wrong or are other people wrong like who's wrong and generally probably the truth is it's probably somewhere in the middle um but I think the thing is gene editing technology is so powerful that we need to make it available to people like eventually the governments are going to come and people are going to regulate this technology. But while it's not being regulated, I think is the time that we need to push the hardest so people get the most access. Because as you were talking about earlier, I think the worst possible outcome is that it's completely controlled by governments and large corporations and wealthy people, mm -hmm. right? And wealthy people are the only ones who have access to this technology. And everybody else is just. Yeah. And so figuring out a way to build that from the ground up to give people who don't have a lot of money access to this technology, give them the knowledge so that they can do it themselves. I think that's just what I'm striving for right now. I do see that because like one of the big pushbacks again is like, OK, you would have these two classes of people, these two groups people who can edit themselves and become superhuman and people who can't and people who can't would usually be the ones who don't have the finances to pay multiple yeah. of dollars to do that. Whereas with this, that bridging that gap to say, look, if you are interested, because you can't just do this on a whim, you actually have to sit down and learn, okay, how can I do this? Let's learn about the cells. Let's learn. It actually does take a lot of internal, like intrinsic knowledge, like intrinsic, not knowledge, but like you, you actually want to do it and you want to learn. So I feel like there would be a specific subgroup of people who would engage in this and through that may filter out, you know, specific types of people. But I guess it's also malicious people with an intent. But hey, if they were malicious with an intent, they wouldn't really necessarily need <laughs> that. They'd probably find other ways of doing that anyway. Yeah, that's what I like to tell people is that like biology doesn't have an intent, right? Biology isn't trying to kill anybody or it's not trying to give you cancer or it's not trying to destroy the world. Like humans are the ones who do that and they'll do that regardless if they have biology or not. And so it's like, where do we draw the line? And there's definitely a line to be drawn. I agree. But what scares me more is gene therapy was just approved in the U.S. a few weeks ago. And the cost is $3.5 million, right? Yeah. That's crazy. So they have this treatment for a disease that they're charging people $3.5 million for. And of course, nobody can afford that. So it's only if you have insurance. And insurance doesn't cover everybody. And it creates a weird, messed up system where it's just like you're trying to insurance that you deserve to get this lovely. treatment rather than like everybody deserves this treatment, right? Yeah, there's, um, I don't know, there are times I'm um, running out, but with GMO food, so I found that quite interesting. We're like, okay, so people start to genetically modify food so that it's more, it grows quicker, it grows bigger. But then, and everyone's like, yeah, this is awesome because people, people. But then when we actually started eating the GMO food, we found out that our bodies weren't processing properly because it wasn't as nutrients dense. And there were all these side effects that came out of it. So even though it came with a positive intent, it yeah, it's not true, a you know, good outcome. It's pretty terrible. Not even GMO, just, I don't know if, depends on what you mean by GMO, but like 
a lot of the produce that we see in the United States, tomatoes are a good example. They've bred the tomatoes and genetically modified them through breeding. I don't know if it's through genetic engineering, but to have tougher skins. Yeah. So that they transport better and they don't get like destroyed during transport, but they taste terrible. Right. And so we are, when you breed for certain traits or genetically modify things for certain traits, a lot of times it can take away other traits and uh, there does need to be a balance, right? Especially like things that are in our food supply. There does need to be a balance of like, I think though that it's like capitalism driving that market, just not thoughtfulness. Because I think sometimes capitalism is the opposite of thoughtfulness. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's an interesting one because like a free market will allow nature to take place. And that's also one of the things with being like editing your genes. Is I almost see it as, well, what happens if this just is the next evolutionary progression? Like. If you become a multi-planetarial species, maybe you will have to survive to the back to the space. Maybe the reason we see yeah. aliens being projected to us as green things with big heads is what happens if we start to turn ourselves green or pink or blue or yellow or whatever else, and our bodies start to shift to allow for that capability. Or people on Mars, Martians would be like, fuck yeah, let's become all weird sort of yeah. thing because there's a whole other planet. And so it's I, I don't see that. I and mean, maybe this is that stepping stone to allow us to transcend to that next level. And yeah. I mean, human beings aren't made for space, right? No. We're like, we're not it. made for space travel. Like, we're not made for existing in zero gravity. Nah. Like, and like, you would imagine if we became a spacefaring species, like, we'd probably try to make ourselves a little bit more better at surviving in Mars. Nah zero oh, gravity awesome. or other planets yeah right through genetic modification yeah. so it does paint a picture to a very interesting future and uh, no i think your kids are pretty interesting i actually wouldn't mind doing a course and learning about it because i feel that, that yeah let us happen. know let me know when you're back in new uh, zealand or australia 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 yeah and uh, yeah we'll ship you out something that's amazing yeah very cool no thanks so much Joe, for your time, this was really insightful. And I think for a lot of the youth, like coming into this world and being like, whoa, okay, what's going on? Because you have all of these older conservative views, which there is some very good points. And then you have this generation of pushback biohackers such as yourselves. And I do see the breaking down of the institutions. I do see the breaking down of, of these molds, even gender molds and what yeah. does that look like as we move forward? So a very interesting discussion and I do appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It was really fun. Cool. All right. Bye, Joe.